picture here, if you want to take a look at this. So if anyone uh, fancies having one of these uh, at one point in your life, uh, studies all. Now, when I, I, wasn't, I, I just had seen these. I thought this was something from a long time ago in England. Before, before we came, I thought that was very interesting. And, uh, and I just heard something on the BBC that they've done away with all this. Is that, do we have, is that true? Does anyone know about that? No, uh, does, what, does anyone know what the point of all that is? Is it just something from history a long time ago? Or? Yeah, I think yeah. Yeah, yeah, it all goes back to history. <laughs> well, when I, when, I, when I was thinking about today, uh, I thought, well, I'll see if I can dig up a little bit about that. Uh, so it would be interesting to find a little bit about a bit about, about the history of all that, but apparently these are these are these are students who study law, and uh, and then I guess when you graduate, you're able to wear one of these <coughs> things and that shows that you are now qualified to be I don't know if it's a barrister or a solicitor or how what all the differences are and all that sort of thing. Um, today we're going to be looking at this next uh, this next section as we walk through particularly the Old Testament. So do you remember what we've done so far? So if you want to get your hands out, for all those who want to, let's see if we can try and remember all these various bits. Okay? So we started with creation, and then there was the fall of man, and then there was the flood. Then the people were split off into the nations, and then there was who? Abraham and Isaac. Followed by the next major character, who was Joseph. There was a period of silence. And then came on the scene, who? Moses, who said, let my people go. We're going to come to this next section now, major section, of trying to understand, in a very small, brief kind of way, this thing of the law. So this will be our, thing, our little sign for law, what that is, from the Jewish perspective as we come into this period of time. But first let me ask you this. Can you recall a particular rule or limitation you had when your children were young or they are young now? Can you, can you just give, me a, give me an example of something that, well, in our house, this is what we did this was the limitation, and this was the rule, and this is just the way it was. Can you think of anything in particular? Any particular thing? Yes, go on. Can't wear your shoes in the house. Can't wear your shoes in the house, okay? You used to make times for meals, getting up and going to bed. Getting up and going to bed, okay. Anything else? Okay, Lee. You do what you want, I'll tell you. You do what you want, yeah. Dad, did you, okay? Okay. Um, why? I'm why do we have these things? What is the point? What is the point? Stability. I'm sorry? Stability. Like stability. Stability. Lives. Okay. Like a discipline. Learn. Discipline. Learn. Yeah. discipline. Yeah. Learn. Yeah. Learn. So, so to, to what? To, to, learn. Learn. to learn. To learn what? To the life. The rules of life is consequences. Life is consequences. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. And how did your children accept these things? Very good. Would they, would they say, oh, Mom and Dad, I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful that you require for me to be in at such and such a time. Or that I'm thankful that you require me to take my shoes off before I come into the house. Or I'm thankful. Yeah, of course not. And why is it, why is it that there is this thing of, I just don't want to do it. We can go we can go along into that as maybe the whys and the wherefores. But the reality is, each one of us as parents, we set up rules and and limitations and boundaries for our children, not because, although they may think it, not to try to make life difficult, not to try to make life a pain but to help them understand that you know, there are rules and limitations for their own good, for their own health and safety, 
I, I doubt any of us would allow your children to go into the kitchen drawer, pull the kitchen drawer, the kitchen drawer open, find the sharpest knife that they can find, and uh, clean your teeth with it. I doubt any of us would allow us to, allow them to do that. And so, although, although our children may not have liked it, they were given by us for a reason, because you... What's the word I'm looking for? Care for them even, even more. You love them. You love them. Love them. And so you require maybe difficult things of them, things they may not like, because you love them. And I'll, as we go through this morning, I just want you to bear that in mind as we think about this time when <clears throat> these Jewish people have now, uh, through Moses, and what Moses said, <coughs> let my people go, and through all those things, through all the events of the Exodus, that they finally have come out of Egypt, a nation of people, multiple millions of people, by the way. Did they go into Egypt as multiple millions? No. It would have been relatively few. Just with Jacob and his sons and their wives and their, and their children, hundreds probably. But then over a period of time, and as things happened, the family got much larger. As a matter of fact, you remember, Pharaoh said, they are getting so large that we have to be incredibly careful because what? Because if, their, if our enemies come, they may side with our enemies, so we're going to set them under taskmasters and make them become slaves. slaves. And that's how all that developed. So we're going to think about this. Let's quickly turn over to Galatians chapter 3. We're going to look at a New Testament, <coughs> New Testament passage here. Now we're actually going to come into this a little bit later on. Because then we're going to quickly look at uh, Exodus chapter 20. We're not going to read everything just because of time's sake. But I want us to try and remember and think about what this really is all about. Galatians chapter 3, verse 23. Okay, New Testament. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Galatians chapter 3, starting in verse 23. It says this. It says, Before the coming of this faith, speaking about Christ, we were held in custody under the law. Speaking of, at least, uh, speaking of the law, that we have been mentioning here, <coughs> the, particularly the Ten Commandments we're going to be looking at very briefly, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. Verse 26. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. Now, hold your place there. Go back to Exodus chapter 20. Genesis, Exodus. This is the classic time when the, the law is given in sort of a one, two, three form. And when we say the law, we're going to limit it to the Ten Commandments for right now. Because if we were to look at the whole of the law for the Jewish people, we'd be here a very, very, very long time. Okay, we're talking about the, the laws for uh, dealing with, with people. We're talking about the laws for uh, how to make clothes and what to do and what not to do. The laws, there's, there's the, the religious uh, uh, side of things, the, the ceremonial side of things, there's marriage, there's all sorts of things to go on, not to mention all the food laws, all that goes into all of that. So, as we begin, I want to ask first a question. The question is this, why in the, why in the world would the law be given? Why? Well, if you think about it, it's not too far from what we just got done mentioning about us and our own children. We give them rules and laws so that they can be safe, so that they know where boundaries are, so that they know how a society works. 
Because if our children grow up with no boundaries, no laws, what's going to happen? Well, yeah, I, sometimes I think we see examples <laughs> around of what happens when children grow up without an understanding of... It's about having a level of control of, as well, though, isn't it? I'm sorry? It's about having a level of control. It is a, well, the level of control, and, 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 and the ultimate goal, the ultimate goal is so that we can prepare our children to become proper adults and members of society to be able to understand how everything works. Now, let, let me throw out, let me throw out a, a couple things here as we kind of get started. First of all, God wanted to create, okay, Lee, we're going to come to this. God wanted to create, I'm going to throw out a word here, a theocracy. All right? Big word. Maybe you've never heard of that word before. Has anyone ever heard of that word before? Theocracy. Okay? Let's, let's pick it apart just a little bit. Theocracy. What does it mean? What, the, what do you think it could mean? So, uh, God bless. Exactly. Okay? So you see the word Theo in there, which means exactly God. The second bit, the theocracy bit, deals with rule or control. So the idea is when God brought the people out of Egypt, He desired, He wanted to be, that, that, that this group of people would be ruled by God Himself. That was His desire. Unfortunately, because the whole sin thing, it didn't work. It didn't work. And that's a whole other story, and we're going to get to that. We're going to get to that. However, let's compare this with a little bit. Um, democracy. What is democracy? What is a democracy? What is that? I'm sorry? Ooh, good. Led by the people. Ruled by the people. Actually, the word uh, demo actually means common people. So the idea is that the common people would vote in their representatives, and then they would be the governing body. A theocracy would be led or governed by by God Himself. That's the idea. That's the idea. How about this? Autocracy. What does that mean? No idea. <laughs> no idea. Now there's different flavors of this. Auto means self or by one. A, a dictatorship would be an example of a democracy. Can you think of any well-known autocracy? I'm sorry, autocracy. Can you think of any well-known autocracies that happened in, in history? I'm sorry? Hitler. Hitler, absolutely. <laughs> he won. Yeah, that may not have been what he, he, he sort of uh, um, advertised as, but eventually it came down to him being the one that controls everything. That was definitely an example of autocracy. But God said that he wanted to be the one. However, I want you to just think about this now. Here they are, the Jewish people, enslaved for, you know, there's, there's various guesses, probably within Egypt, 150 to 200 years, under what kind of, what kind of governing, governing body was it? In Egypt, what kind of, what kind of, of those words we just got done thrown out? It was a... Autocracy. By who was the autocrat? Who was it? It was Pharaoh. Whatever Pharaoh said, said that's what you did. And if you were to question Pharaoh, what would happen? <laughs> off of off of his head. Yeah, <laughs> off of his head. <coughs> For 150 to 200 years, that is the rule that they are under. Before that, as they lived, there was. There was, uh, there was Jacob, there was all, and they lived as sort of nomads, going from place to place. And what kind of rule were they under then? In, in a way, it was very much an autocracy as well, because there was generally the one bloke, the Jacob, who would have incredible control over the family and the children and so forth and so on. But they had a bit of a different kind of situation as they moved about. Uh, so, but now they come into a situation where they've just come out of Egypt. Even if we forget about the time when they were nomads, in that 150 to 200 years, that is a long time. Okay? How many generations are right? Three, four, three, four generations at least. Okay. Of living under total autocracy, under Pharaoh, and then slavery, which means what? They had absolutely no choice to 
what they did, when they did it, how they did it. All of a sudden, the, 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 uh, uh, Moses comes on the scene. He says, let my people go. We go through all the ten plagues. We didn't go through all that. We go through all the ten plagues to the final one. And all of a sudden, Pharaoh says, get out of here. I don't want to see you ever again. Well, we know he does, but uh, that's another story. They pack up all their things. The Bible then says even the Egyptians gave them their gold and silver to get them out of there. Um, and so they, they, they leave by the tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands, even multiple millions as they leave Egypt. And they're shouting and, and singing and dancing and, and saying, isn't it great to finally be free? But oh, wait a minute, all of a sudden there's a problem. What's the problem? No law. No there's no law. There's no, there's no rules. They, they don't even know what a rule would look like because Pharaoh has been the only one that's, that's told them what to do. Do we have anything in our history that's somewhat kind of similar? I think yes. I think yes. Um, okay, now this may, this may be something, if we had a, a quiz game, I'm, I'm thinking of Pete right now. Okay, can you think of uh, something that's common between 1807, if I give you the dates, 1807 and 1863, now this may be a tough one, what is common between the dates 1803 and 1867, Eight, um, 1863 and 1807, sorry about that, can you, is there anything that would ring a bell, now you have to really know your history in order to Okay? As soon as I say something, you're going to say, aha. Okay? If I said William, that, would that help out at all? William Wilberforce. Thank you. Okay? What did he do? He was the one who was, who was, who was the one who in Parliament had said that he pushed for the freedom of slavery. And then, who was it on the state side that did the similar sort of thing in 1863? Some years later. Who was it? you know? Lincoln. Lincoln. Well done. Abraham Lincoln. The Emancipation Proclamation, as it said, that he said that he said this is this is what happened with the result of the Civil War. That uh, that thankfully the North won, and now fr uh, slaves were free. But what was the problem? What was the problem? They didn't know what to do. They didn't know what to do. They've had someone tell them. Now I've now I don't know if anyone's seen Roots. It's horrendous. It's, it's brutal. It's awful. It's, it's unbelievable. But one of the things that stood out to me was, was when all of a sudden freedom came, and the question is, well, now what do we do? Now what do we do? They've been slaves under, under, the, under these landowners, these plantations for so many years that they had no other frame of reference. They did, he said they did not know what it was like to be free and how to deal with freedom. And how, do, how, do you take, how do you take care of your family? What do you do for work? You've always been provided. What do you do? So this is the background now for this thing that we're going to call the law. So we're going to go quickly to Exodus chapter 20. And we're going to look at what I'm going to call the Ten Commandments, the commandments summarized. We've actually took, we did a whole series on this some time ago. And we won't be able to go into each one in detail just because of time's sake. But let's quickly take a look at this in Exodus chapter 20 and try to pull out some gems here because we need to remember also the reason for the law and that God was trying, is not trying to be mean. God's not trying to ruin our fun. But if we, if we take our series back all the way back into January... Now remember that God created us in unique and special ways. That we are the image of Him. And that He loves us as a creator. And so now God is saying, because you are now, because you are now free, you're not under any sort of autocracy, and that I want to create a theocracy. I want to be your God. I want to be the one who... Uh, who is, who is helping you and guiding you, we, I, we give you these laws, these rules, these guidelines in order to help your life. First of all, so the Ten Commandments summarize. Well done. So first of all, let's take just, just a minute at the first verse. 
uh, first couple of verses actually. And God spoke these words in Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. And God spoke these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. So first of all, God sets out two things. He sets out, number one, who He is, and then He sets out what He's done. He says, I am the Lord your God. Now if you notice in your Bible, quite probably the word Lord is in small capitals. Do you see that in your Bibles? Okay, small capitals. What that means is that it is the same name, the same word that was given to Moses back on the mountain. Remember when Moses asked, what shall I tell them your name is? He says, I am that I am. God is saying, I am the one that met with Moses up on the mountain, and I am the ever-present one. I am the one who has been around forever, and I am that one. So I am the Lord your God. And this is the thing that's going to trip up the, the, the Jews again and again and again. Because it's not too long down the road when things get a little bit tough, and they get a bit thirsty, and they get a bit hungry. You know what the first thing they do is? They say, oh Moses, why have you, you done this? You brought us out of Egypt while there were leeks and onions. Not that I like leeks, but leeks and onions and all this kind of stuff. And it was provided for us. But now we're out here in this desert. And I'm hungry and I'm thirsty. And they forget so quickly. So God wants to straight away, straight away when they come to this time, He wants to say, listen, I am the Lord your God. And don't you forget, don't you forget we are so quick to forget that I am the one who brought you out of slavery. So all the law is set on that foundation that God, He is the God. Uh, and he's saying, he's saying this, He's saying, you know, all those gods of Egypt that Pharaoh set himself up as God, Ra, the sun god, and all the various gods, by the way, if you ever watched uh, uh, what is it, Joseph on the, the, the cartoon version? Quite, quite interesting, because it's quite good. You'll learn a lot on that, okay? Uh, and and so, and so all these various gods, God is saying, regardless of what you saw in Egypt, I am the Lord your God. And I am the one that brought you out of slavery. Now, if we get that right in our minds and our hearts, that's going to solve a lot of problems. That's going to sort a lot of dilemmas in your life on what to do and how to see things. Okay? There is only one God. Eric, how do you know that the Christian God... Okay, that's a whole other question. We can, we can come to that. But if we can settle our minds that there is one God, and He is that God, and He is the one who died for us, and we celebrated the resurrection last week, that He is the one that brought us out of the slavery of... And if we can really grab onto that and hold on to that and remember as we have communion that Jesus died for us, that He did all that for us because He loves us. you. If that can be the foundation that we build on, that's, as I said, that's going to solve a lot of issues. It's going to solve a lot of problems. So first of all, God sets out who He is. And he sets out what he's done. The first four commandments, the first four commandments, commandments one through four, and we've gone through this before. Let's quickly, uh, for those who, who've done through the drawing thing, all the little memory devices to try and help remember this. <coughs> the first one is, the first one is what? God is number one. He wants to be number one. The second one is very <coughs> similar. He says what? Don't worship any yeah, false idols. idols. And number three is what? Three is, remember, don't take God's name in vain. Carry around God's name very carefully as if it's precious. And how many people do we hear throw, away, throw around God's name like it's a dirty rag? And what's the fourth? What's the fourth? 
Who, oh, what? What? Remember the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath. Well done. Now, oddly enough, uh, I, I need to go through and check this out my, myself sometime. Someone said that that's, the, the fourth commandment is the only one that Jesus never actually mentioned in the Gospels. I don't know if that's true or not. I'd have to check that out. But the point is that we are not bound by the Sabbath. There are some organizations, for example, there's a group called the Seventh-day Adventists, who would still hold to the Sabbath. That's fine. Nothing wrong with that at all. Nothing wrong with that at all. So the reason why we meet on Sunday is that we look at the New Testament model, and the Bible says that they actually met every day, but then the Sunday seems to be the point where people gathered together uh, as, as, as time went on. <laughs> the first day of the week to remember. Why, why, what happened on the first day of the week? Okay. 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 What happened on the first day of the week? Okay. That Jesus rose again. Okay. okay, so. Yeah. So on those all those first four commandments are all geared toward our relationship with God. God's number one, don't work, don't make any false idols. Number three, be very careful about God's name. And number four, for us, what that means is that, that we have time that we set aside for God to be able to focus on Him. So there's two elements that, that focuses on. Number one, that focuses on, and the question is. Where is God in our spiritual life? Our spiritual lives. Oh, Eric, we're in church on Sunday. I understand all that. Okay, but do we really? Do we really get it? Do, do we really accept that we all have a spiritual element within us? We are spiritual beings. Yeah, I know we got this, this, this fleshy thing. I know that. We have a body. I get that. But we also have a spirit. Well, Eric, I mean, did I have a spirit be before I became a Christian? Of course you did. Of course you did. Now the spirit was dead. And when, we, when, when someone meets Christ, the spirit becomes alive. There's, there's a whole lot of, whole lot of, uh, whole lot of uh, complication there. We, we, we will come to that. But the point is that, that we all, everybody worships something. Everyone in Rosington worships something is the, top of the, uh, the, is the top of the heap for everybody in the world, in Rosenthal, okay? And what we value the most is the thing that we worship. Most people, most people, I would say in the West now, <laughs> the thing that's on the top of the heap is what? Wow. Themselves. Themselves. They have no space for this thing called God because Eric sits on Eric's throne and, and, and I don't want anyone else to have any room on that, any, any, any space there. It's all about those three important people who are, again, me, me myself, and I. those three important people. But number two, not only that, but the second one, the second part of this is uh, commandments number uh, one through four ask this, where is God in your spiritual life, but also where is God in your emotional life? emotional life. Eric, what do you mean by that? What I mean by this? Is that the thing that's different about Christianity than all other religions is that the Bible shows God as a personal God. Do you understand what I mean by that? For example, Islam views God. You can ask Jason about Jason. Uh, uh, Islam is viewed as a God that's way out there, powerful, but he's angry, and he's not personal. Matter of fact, I was speaking to a couple of, this, of the Muslims, and they would actually be offended to suggest that God was a personal God, that you can actually have a relationship with God. And that's the view of, of, of religions around the world, that, that either this God is like that, or these gods are, uh, are, are, are looking for you to do something wrong, something bad, that they can get out the lightning bolt and do like, like that. Okay? That is often the view. But in the Bible, as we see what it says, that God is a personal God. And remember it said, when, when, when we saw how that when God met with Moses, he said that I <coughs> saw their condition in Egypt, and my heart grieved, and he wanted to do something about it. That is a personal God. So we love and we serve a 
first son has some good news. That's commandment one through four. Commandments five through now we, we can get along with that. We can get on with that. It's commandments six through ten are the more difficult ones. We don't like these as much because they start to uh, word in, in, encroach into our personal lives a bit more. Commandments five through ten. Can we go through them real quickly? Commandment number five is honor your honor your parents, your mother and your father. Number six is do not murder. Thank you. Number seven is do not. Nope, nope. Getting there. Getting there. Do not commit adultery. Oh, well done. Do not commit adultery. Number eight is do not. Do not steal. Number nine is do not lie. Number ten is. Yeah, okay, yeah. Don't be jealous. Don't cut it. Don't be jealous of what other people have. And I'm sure none of us have ever been guilty of any of those things, right? Oh, Absolutely. Everyone's walking around with halos and all sorts of things. We're going to quickly run down through what I think is the crux of the matter of each of those six. First of all, in this thing of number five, which, is, which, which, which deals with uh, honor your, your mother and your father. We need to ask ourselves, in what place does God have in our physical life, in our dealings with other people, in your view of authority? Your view of authority. authority. Eric, what does is, what is my parents have to do with the authority of my, my life right now? Because I'm an adult, and that's right. I understand that. I understand that. But it all starts when we are children. And that's why I think one of the problems that we have now in 2019 is that parents don't understand and children don't understand authority. what authority means. Mm -hmm. The number of little ones who would go toe to toe with me and tell me all kinds of and I could I would now I'm now I'm not 150 years old, but I could never imagine as a kid saying the things to an adult. I have kids say to me today. I can't, imagine, I can't imagine. I can't fathom it. And I think the fundamental problem is this, is that, is that children are not taught on the whole. I'm not saying there's not good examples and there are good examples. But on the whole, children are not learning what authority is. Now, I'm not saying authority is perfect. I understand that. There is no perfect parent. There's no perfect policeman. There is no perfect government official. There's no perfect... You know, <laughs> We won't have to go there. Uh, all those sort of things. But the idea is, is that God gave parents the authority over their children. Now, I know Chad is sitting back there, but he's an adult now, so he won't be embarrassed by this. One of our children, many years ago, asked me this question. I didn't know how to answer it. And I may have mentioned this to you before. But... One of my children says, Dad, why is it that we have to obey you, but you don't have to obey us? <laughs> now, oh, wow, it's quite that's good. a good question, that's isn't a deep, it? Deep question. That's a yeah. deep question. I thought that was, that was quite profound. And I was scratching my head. That's how I got bald, by the way. I scratched my head a lot. I scratched my head. I thought, man, I need to think about it. And it's not that I have more value than my children. But that God has given me the authority over my, you understand, the authority over my children. And then now, now my two older ones are such an age where they're adults in their own right. And uh, we have a different kind of relationship right now. I have a 15-year-old who thinks he's <laughs> at times. But still, he's living under my roof. I pay for all of his, <laughs> I pay for all of his worldly goods. And, uh, and uh, no, he does not do whatever he wants to do because he is under my authority, under my house, under my authority. And so the, the value of this is that as they grow up, they, 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 they accept the idea that there is an authority, that I'm not free to do whatever I want to do, and there is, as someone said, consequences tied to actions. And we need to rear a generation that remembers that this is the reality of life. I wish that we were under a theocracy now, but we are not. We are not. So the view of authority, but as 
parents, as, as, as people in, in, in Rosington, uh, most of us, uh, that we need to be living as a theocracy as much as possible. It's just number five, that a, a, a view of, of authority. Uh, number, 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 number six, uh, what place does God have in our physical life about the view of the value Do not, do not murder. And I know there's a whole lot of various uh, uh, paths and avenues that we can go down there. And there's lots of things that we can talk about that, that we just don't have time for. But the question, and we may need to have to stretch this out sometime until next week. I know there's lots of questions that people have. Lots of current issues that people deal with. There's all kinds of questions about what happens if someone who's um, older or has a, a medical condition so that there is no more value of life. And this whole thing of euthanasia, okay, what is euthanasia like? Want to die. Yeah, yeah, want to die and it's well, suicide. suicide. Yeah, it's yeah. It's like, listen, I'm not, I'm not even going to pretend to be clever enough to try to unravel all of that. There's a massive question. If I said, if I said the term Roe versus Wade, does that mean anything to anyone here? Mm -hmm. Caroline knows what I'm on about. This is a, oh, 1970s, if I can remember right. This is a court case back in the States. That up until that point, abortion was illegal. I'm not saying it didn't happen, but I'm saying this, the, the state, the government did not fund it. Uh, Roe versus Wade was a landmark court battle that argued that. Uh, that the, the woman has a right to an abortion and so forth and so on. Now, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a woman. I can't even pretend that I understand uh, all, of the, all, all the emotions on and all what goes on. What I do know is that is that God values life in a massively so Eric, what, what about times when a woman is attacked and she gets pregnant? I understand. I understand. It's very, very, very difficult. Very, very Can difficult. I just say something about this? There's been a lot of research done about women who are raped and have babies and one thing but it's really interesting in the outcome. Yeah, it's... I, 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 do, I, I do know that I've heard many stories of, of, of women who have... Who have I know it would be easy for me to say things. Uh, many stories of, of, of women who have gone through that trauma and then, and then have the face, do I keep the baby, do I not keep the baby, and if I keep the baby, then what? And, you know, the only thing I can say is that I've seen any number of incredible stories of incredibly brave women who carried on with the pregnancy even as a result of violence, carry on with the pregnancy, and that they're so happy that they did. Now, whether they gave up the child for adoption or kept the child, um, at the end of the day, it's still a person. It's still a child. And so, as we think about Commandment 6, God setting up boundaries and and rules and how to live and how to get on. He says, first of all, how do we how do we view this thing with authority? Do, do we try and instill within our children, and our grandchildren, by the way, mm -hmm. grandparents? You know what? Boy, I wish I wish Lisa's mom and dad and my mom. Gosh, I wish we would have been around. We we just physically weren't around them. And you know what? You all have such an opportunity. You have such an opportunity. Mm -hmm. Your grandkids, I know, look up to you, and you have time for them, and you have an opportunity to instill all these values into them, <coughs> mom and dad, because they're running around and working and doing all this kind of stuff. And I know it's still our job. I get that. It's still our job, primarily. But your grandparents have an opportunity. Grab them. So are we instilling the idea of authority within our children? And number two, 
as complicated as all this stuff is. And I'm, just talk, I'm not just talking about the abortion thing. I'm just not talking about euthanasia. There's a whole another whole swath of things. But at the end of it all, do we value life? Do we value life? Because when God created Adam and Eve, He created Adam. The Bible says that as He created them, I don't know how God did it, I don't know. He said He created them from the dust of the earth. And then He breathed in, in the most unique way that He didn't do with any other creature. He breathed in Him with the breath Him in his image. And how dare we, how dare we play God? I'm sorry, how dare we play God in thinking that we can have control over life and death? We should not take on that role. We should not. We value life. And I, do, and I know this is, and if there's anyone that hit, this has touched personally, I, I'm not judging, I'm not trying to be cruel in any way, shape, or form. And I don't know all the backgrounds, and, and, uh, and please don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm simply saying, right now, as I stand, I know that God wants us to value life. Father, thank you so so much for today. And Father, I know we've had, we've had to try and have some time in order to, to, to build a bit of a platform for this and try to, to understand the reason, the purpose for the law, even the Ten Commandments. And um, Father, right now, God, we ask that you would just meet with us here this morning. But Lord, I know that... Um, would, you, would you mind coming up with something as you do? Nice and soft. God, we uh, realize that life is full of complications. And uh, goodness, we, we all have things and, and people and situations in our life that is just plain tough. But God, thank you that you are our loving Heavenly Father. And that you, you didn't set up this system, these rules, these commandments, in order to make life difficult or to spoil our fun and all of these kind of things. But God, that you love us in an incredibly powerful way that we have such a hard time understanding. Father, we pray that you would help every person here today. And I know it's very possible that there's been some things said that may have touched on a very raw nerve. Father, we want to pray that you would just meet with each person today. God, whether it's a, whether because we're dealing with thing, this, this thing of authority or this thing of preciousness of life. And God, I know that <clears throat> these are all difficult topics and very sensitive. But Father, I pray that, that we'd be able to all come to an understanding of regardless of may what have happened in the past, God, that we could come to an understanding of how you see these things, how that having an understanding of authority is important, how that having an understanding of the preciousness of life is important. Father, I ask that you would just bring healing to what to whoever needs something special this morning. God, I'm not going to ask for hands in any way, shape, or form because this is far too, far too sensitive a topic. But Father, right now I'm going to ask God that you would just meet with each person, each family that has something on their heart. Because God, you're the one, you're, the Bible calls you the great physician. God, you're the one that can bring healing and wholeness. And God, I ask that you would just meet with us here this morning. 
Father, I want to thank you for your love for us. Lord, I pray that you would help us in our dealings this week. And maybe of the person that we'll be speaking to, maybe, maybe, we're going to, maybe we're going to even meet up with somebody who is contemplating this thing of worship. And God, maybe that you might be able to use us to be able to be a help to them. Lord, we ask that you would just bless every person, for every family, that you would help us this week to be your light, no matter where we go, no matter what we do. In Jesus' name we pray.